section nineteen of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter nineteen mr frank curtis's pleasant adventure about half an hour previous to the visit of lord ellingham mr frank curtis was lounging along piccadilly with a swell mob kind of ease and a bag nig wells independence when a young female of good figure and pretty face attracted his notice as he was proceeding in one way and she in another they passed each other and mr curtis having nothing to do it struck him that he would endeavour to scrape an acquaintance with the young person alluded to he accordingly turned round hesitated for a moment how to devise an excuse for addressing himself to her and then drawing forth his own white cambric pocket-handkerchief hurried after the object of his interest i beg your pardon miss he said tapping her gently upon the shoulder but i think you dropped this handkerchief the young female immediately replied in the negative but a smile played upon her lips and her blue eyes assumed an arch expression implying that she fully saw through the young man's trick which was indeed transparent enough i really thought it was yours miss exclaimed curtis by no means abashed but if it isn't why i must keep it till i find the owner that's all i rather think it is with the owner now sir answered the young woman well my dear said frank i see you suspect my stratagem but you are such a sweet pretty creature that i was resolved to introduce myself to you now don't be angry my love i mean all i assert and if you will only tell me where and when i can see you again i am sure you won't be sorry to make my acquaintance upon my word cried the young woman in that dubious manner which might have meant disgust or which might be taken as encouragement mr curtis strong in his self-conceit adopted the latter view and became more pressing in his attentions now do let me see you again there's a dear he exclaimed continuing to walk by her side if you'll only agree to meet me this evening i'll take you to the play and i'll buy you a gold chain money is no object to me my love a man with ten thousand a year and a peerage in the perspective may indulge his little fancies i hope these falsehoods conveyed by implication were uttered in such a tone of assurance that the young woman was evidently dazzled by their splendour and she threw a rapid but encouraging glance towards the mendacious frank come now will you meet me again he demanded i was going over to stay a few days with the prime minister of france early next month and i had promised to pass my christmas with his holiness the pope at rome but if you was only kind now why there's no saying that i might not send excuses to both of them and stay in london for the pleasure of seeing you but you men are such gay deceivers said the young female well we may be sometimes ejaculated frank rather looking upon the imputation as a compliment than a reproach but you're too pretty for a man to find it in his heart to deceive you my dear in one word where shall you be at seven o'clock this evening i did think of calling upon a friend which is lady's maid in a family living in conduit street replied the young woman and if your friend is a lady's maid my dear said frank what may you be the same sir was the answer the very thing cried curtis if there's one class of young ladies that i like more than another it is the lady's maids why my dear when i left paris where i stayed some time with the archbishop of that city for his grace and i are as thick as two thieves the ladies maids held a meeting and appointed a committee to draw up an address expressive of regret and all that sort of thing at my going away they did upon my honour but let us come to the point my dear shall you be in conduit street this evening at about seven i think it's very likely sir was the answer but you must not go with me any farther now for i live at the house with the bay windows there but whose service are you in my dear asked frank in lady georgiana hatfield's replied the young woman indeed cried curtis i've heard an uncle of mine speak of her ladyship i think but this is a great nuisance though 
what is asked charlotte whom our readers may remember to have been mentioned at the opening of this tale why that you and me must separate just at the moment that we are getting so friendly together and without a single kiss either charlotte giggled but said nothing you will really be in conduit street this evening my dear urged frank curtis after a brief pause i think i shall be able to get out responded charlotte but her ladyship is an invalid and miss mordaunt her friend or companion or whatever she is may want me to dress her for some ball or party and so i cannot promise for sure but you will try yes murmured the young woman and she hurried on to the front door of lady hatfield's house curtis stopped at a short distance and watched her as she tripped along her pretty feet and ankles peering from beneath the folds of her dress now it happened that at the very moment when charlotte was about to ring the bell the front door opened and a livery servant issued forth doubtless upon some errand after exchanging a word or two with charlotte he passed on and the young woman entered the house but ere she closed the door she turned a sly glance upon frank curtis who the instant he saw the livery servant make his appearance sauntered very leisurely along in the most innocent-looking manner in the world the livery servant was now out of sight and the pretty face of the lady's maid lingered at the door which she kept ajar curtis looked hastily around and the coast being tolerably clear at the moment he darted up to the entrance charlotte had merely remained on the threshold to give him a parting glance of intelligence for the purpose of assuring him of the sincerity of her promise that she would endeavour to meet him in the evening for the young lady was of an intriguing disposition and flattered herself that she had captivated some very great or at all events some very wealthy person but when she saw him thus precipitately rush towards the entrance she drew back and endeavoured to shut the door frank was however too quick for her and he fairly thrust himself into the hall closing the street door behind him for god's sake go away sir said charlotte imploringly not till i have had one kiss just one cried frank and he threw his arms round the lady maid's neck oh do let me go sir the servants will come and i shall be ruined she murmured vainly struggling with the young man who not only considered the adventure a capital joke but was also excited by his present contact with a pretty girl he glued his lips to hers and pressed her closely to him when a loud double knock suddenly echoed through the hall good heavens what shall i do exclaimed charlotte in a tone of despair then in another moment she recovered her presence of mind and throwing open a side door said in a rapid and earnest tone go in there sir and if any one comes pray invent some excuse for your being here but don't compromise me curtis darted into the parlour with which the side door communicated the lady's maid hurried away and old mason speedily made his appearance to answer the summons conveyed by the double knock is miss mordaunt at home inquired a voice which curtis who was listening anxiously on the inner side of the parlour door immediately recognised to be that of his worthy uncle yes sir christopher miss mordaunt is at home replied mason please to walk in sir this way sir miss mordaunt is with lady hatfield in the drawing-room i wish to see miss mordaunt alone if you please said sir christopher give my compliments and if miss mordaunt will accord me a few minutes upon some little matter of a private nature certainly sir christopher responded the domestic have the goodness to step into this room sir and frank curtis now as miserable as he was insolent and exulting a few moments previously when embracing charlotte in the hall heard the footsteps of mason and his uncle approaching the very door at which he was listening not a moment was to be lost he was too much confused too much bewildered to think of meeting the embarrassment of his position with a good face and a bold excuse and concealment instantly suggested itself to his coward mind a cheerful fire was burning in the grate and near it was drawn a sofa the cushion of which had rich fringes that hung all round and drooped nearly to the carpet to thrust himself beneath this friendly sofa was the work of an instant 
with frank curtis and so rapidly was the manoeuvre executed that the fringes had even ceased to rustle when sir christopher blunt stalked pompously into the apartment mason withdrew to deliver the knight's message to miss mordaunt and in the meantime the knight himself paced the room in somewhat an agitated manner at length he walked straight up to a handsome mirror and looking fully at his image as it was reflected in the glass began to apostrophize himself sir christopher blunt sir christopher blunt he exclaimed aloud in a solemn tone what is it that you are about to do are you taking a wise or an imprudent step are you in a word about to ensure your own happiness or or to make a damned old fool of yourself frank curtis was astounded at this language which came from the lips of his uncle despite of his fears and the unpleasant predicament in which he found himself he was on the point of yielding to his natural propensity for mischief and blurting forth an affirmative response to the latter portion of the knight's self-interrogation when the door opened and a lady entered the room curtis accordingly held his peace and his breath too as much as he could for his curiosity was now so intense as to master even his fears miss mordaunt said the knight suddenly turning away from the glass and advancing as jauntily as his massive frame would permit to meet the lady i have to apologize for this early visit oh no apology sir christopher exclaimed julia in a most affable manner pray be seated allow me said the knight and taking her hand he led her to the very sofa beneath which his nephew lay concealed then seating himself at a respectful distance from her but also on the sofa he continued thus i hope miss mordaunt that i shall not offend you with what i am going that is with what i am about i mean with what i am on the point of very intelligible all this thought frank curtis to himself sir christopher blunt is incapable of offending a lady especially a young one observed miss julia blushing in the most approved style on such interesting occasions for she could anticipate what was coming sir christopher blunt thanks you for that compliment miss mordaunt said the knight pompously and encouraged also by the lady's tone and manner yes i am indeed incapable of giving offence wilfully although there are certain vulgar people east of temple bar who pretend that i treat them cavalierly and thank heaven miss mordaunt i was not elected alderman of portsoken for i never could have put up with all the filthy guzzling and swilling excuse the expressions ma'am that seem inseparable from city affairs you know perhaps miss mordaunt that my origin was humble i may say that it was nothing at all but i glory in that fact it is my boast my pride true merit is sure to force its way in the world sir christopher observed julia with a smile which displaying her white teeth quite enchanted the amorous knight again i thank you for the good opinion of me implied by that remark he said edging himself a little closer to the lady my large fortune for large it notoriously is miss mordaunt has all been acquired by my own honest industry and the title which i have the honour to bear was bestowed upon me by a gracious prince in approbation of my conduct as a public officer you occupy an enviable position in society sir christopher said julia do you really think so miss asked the knight endeavouring to assume a soft and plaintive tone but with as little success as if he were a boatswain labouring under a severe cold do you really think so and again he edged himself nearer to his companion ah my dear miss mordaunt how happy should i be to lay my fortune my title my all at the feet of some charming lady who like yourself would not despise the man that has risen by his own honest exertions to i may say affluence and honour miss mordaunt cast down her eyes and worked herself up into a most interesting state of blushing excitement while sir christopher boldly took her hand and pressed it to his lips 
the knight's foot was thrust some little way under the sofa and as he wore blutcher boots it was not difficult to stick a pin into the calf of his leg if any one had felt so disposed such an idea certainly struck his dutiful nephew at that instant for mr frank curtis now fully comprehended the object of his uncle's visit to miss julia mordaunt and the matrimonial designs of the said uncle foreboded anything but essential benefit to himself then although he was not the brightest young man in existence the selfish motive of sir christopher in agreeing to purchase mr torrens's elder daughter as his frank's wife flashed upon his mind and in an instant he comprehended the entire policy of sir christopher as well as the reader already understands it with regard to the recent matrimonial speculation which tom rainford had so materially aided to render abortive we digressed just at the point where sir christopher was venturesome enough to press the hand of miss mordaunt to his lips oh sir christopher murmured the lady apparently quite abashed and forgetting most probably in the agitation of the moment to withdraw her fair fingers julia my love for so you must now permit me to call you exclaimed the enamoured knight will my suit be rejected can you receive it favourably at this moment you see before you a man whom it is in your power to render happy or miserable for life and ah dear me what a dreadful dream i had last night it was that dream which made me come to you so early to-day to know your decision for whether it was your image my beloved julia or the cold roast pig that i eat for dinner i'm sure i can't say but true it is that oh screamed the knight in a fit of agony my dear sir christopher what what is the matter asked miss mordaunt alarmed by the sudden ejaculation which was accompanied by an equally sudden start oh nothing nothing said the knight endeavouring to compose himself a sudden twitch in the leg just like the pricking of a pin but it is nothing a mere sensation i was going to tell you my dear julia about that horrid dream pray sir christopher don't tell me anything about horrid dreams exclaimed miss mordaunt you will frighten me out of my wits well dearest i will not but you have not told me yet whether i may consider that this fair hand which i now press to my lips oh and again the knight started violently what is the matter sir christopher asked julia earnestly really i can't make it out i don't know but this is the second time that the same sensation has seized me in the left leg stammered the knight just for all the world like the pricking of a pin and yet of course it cannot be that but pray pardon these unpleasant interruptions julia and relieve me from suspense at once say tell me dearest one will you will you consent to be mine oh sir christopher what do you ask murmured miss mordaunt as if there were anything extraordinary or unexpected in the question what do i ask repeated the enamoured knight i ask you to bestow upon me this fair hand how can i refuse you sir christopher sighed the lady you are so killing am i dearest ejaculated the knight and encouraged more than ever by this assurance he boldly kissed his companion but almost immediately a cry of agony burst from his lips and starting up from the sofa he exclaimed my leg my leg the the devil's in it and that's the fact the fact was however somewhat different for mr frank curtis having very quietly and deliberately taken his breastpin from the frill of his shirt was amusing himself with the very pleasant pastime of thrusting the point into his uncle's leg on the third occasion of the application of the aforesaid breastpin sir christopher started up and danced about the room while miss mordaunt who was most anxious to bring the delicate topic of discourse to such a point that she might satisfy herself as to the very day on which she was to change her condition endeavoured to her utmost to console him convinced that the pain he experienced could be nothing more than some sudden but very galling spasmodic attack neither sir christopher nor julia entertained the least thought of looking beneath the sofa they therefore reseated themselves upon it and continued their tender discourse and when shall it be asked sir christopher taking it for granted that it was to be whenever that is so soon i mean when you choose murmured miss mordaunt 
but you will communicate your intentions to my brother who obtained his captaincy a few days ago and whom i must consult and why consult him asked sir christopher a misgiving entering his mind oh he might i do not say that he will but he might object answered miss mordaunt then perhaps you wish me to state my views to my nephew also said the knight somewhat testily as he might also object but a nephew sir christopher urged the lady a nephew is not a brother very true replied blunt as if some grand truth had just been made apparent to him and yet it appears julia he added in a coaxing tone that we have each a relation to whom we would rather not mention the matter until after it was over oh you killing man what would you have me understand by that remark cried miss mordaunt simply that we should should what dear sir christopher should be married privately or run away to gretna green answered the knight and now the truth is out oh naughty naughty man exclaimed julia casting on her swain one of her most bewitching smiles but at the same time she imagined to herself all the excitement attending a runaway match to gretna the rapidity of travelling the bustle that would be excited at the wayside inns the sensation that must arise in the fashionable world the paragraphs in the newspapers the eclat attached to such a proceeding and the importance with which her reappearance in town after the union would be attended of all this she thought and the knight's proposal was therefore most welcome to her for while she contemplated the agreeable side of the picture she never once reflected on the ridicule and absurdity that must attach themselves to such a step on the part of two persons of the respective ages of sir christopher blunt and herself well dearest what are you thinking of asked the knight of what you were saying dear sir christopher murmured the lady in a languishing tone then how shall it be a private marriage or gretna the arrangements for a private marriage might be suspected sighed julia casting down her eyes and managing a blush which was respectable enough seeing that it scarcely came voluntarily to her aid just my opinion ejaculated sir christopher i would not have that prying nephew of mine frank curtis the young scapegrace getting a hint of it beforehand for any money nor would i wish my brother to know of it until it is all over dear sir christopher returned julia then be it gretna exclaimed the knight and now when shall it take place i could not say to-day sir christopher but to-morrow to-morrow murmured the lady in a faint tone as if quite overpowered by the importance of the step she was about to take but which she would willingly have taken long before had the proposal been made to her to-morrow she added i shall be prepared to i understand you my angel interrupted the knight and this time he caught the lady fairly in his arms and subjected her to a process of hearty kissing mr frank curtis had in the meantime restored his breastpin to the frill of his shirt for since the conversation had turned upon a regular elopement the matter had become far too serious for him to trifle with he suddenly found himself menaced with something bordering on total disinheritance in respect to his uncle's property for even if this projected union should yield no issue still the lady might obtain so much influence over the knight as to induce him to will all his fortune to herself frank was therefore in rather an unpleasant state of mind as well as being in an uneasy predicament under the sofa he nevertheless saw that cunning must be met with cunning and he now lay as quiet as a mouse in order to avoid detection but he vowed seriously that the moment he should escape from the kind of prison in which he found himself he would not let the grass grow under his feet ere he adopted measures to defeat the matrimonial scheme of sir christopher blunt and miss julia mordaunt at length to his unspeakable relief the knight took his leave of miss mordaunt after having settled the hour and place where they were to meet on the following evening sir christopher being gone julia also left the room and poor charlotte who had been on the tenterhooks of suspense and alarm ever since frank curtis had first entered the house now hurried to the parlour wondering how he could possibly have managed to avoid an exposure 
but when she entered the room and perceived no one she was more astonished still her surprise was not however of long duration for curtis having peeped through the fringe and ascertained who the newcomer was suddenly emerged from his hiding-place oh dear me sir exclaimed the young woman what a fright i have been in to be sure and what a pickle i have been in cried frank sulkily you cannot say that it was my fault sir observed charlotte reproachfully nor more i do my dear answered curtis warming himself into a better humour by means of a kiss or two on the lady's maid's red lips but i say my dear he continued after a few moments dalliance of that sort you must come to meet me this evening because independent of my desire to chat with you and all that sort of thing you can be of service to me lord sir cried charlotte astonished at this intimation indeed you can but i must not stay to explain myself now returned curtis here my dear take these five guineas as an earnest of what i will do for you and mind and be punctual in conduit street at seven o'clock this evening i shall not fail sir replied charlotte and in the meantime added frank watch miss mordaunt well don't ask me any questions now i will tell you all about it this evening but mind you watch her and if possible get into conversation with her should she ask you to do her any service no matter of what kind promise her that you will and leave the rest to me do you hear yes sir and i will do as you tell me was the answer well then that's right said curtis and now let me see if i can't slip out without running plump up against one of your liveried flunkies here wait an instant cried charlotte and she disappeared from the room closing the door carefully behind her in a few moments she returned with the welcome tidings that the coast was clear and frank curtis succeeded in quitting lady hatfield's house without being perceived by any one save the faithful charlotte End of section nineteen section twenty of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter twenty happiness the diamond merchant when lord ellingham took his leave of lady hatfield the latter hurried to her bedchamber and locking the door behind her sat down in an armchair near the fire to ponder unconstrainedly upon the conversation of the previous hour and that hour what changes had it worked in respect to the mind and prospects of this patrician lady oh how generous and noble-hearted is my arthur she mused inwardly how boundless is his love for me but is it possible that i am really to become his wife or am i the sport of a wild and delusive dream no it is all true i am awake i see the various objects around me there is no confusion in my brain yes it is all true and he will marry me he will make me his wife in spite of but let me avoid thinking of the past the future is now bright and glorious before me my own arthur whom i love so fondly and who alone has ever possessed and will possess my heart my own noble generous arthur has surmounted all prejudice flung aside all disgust and has promised to make me happy oh not in the wildest of my dreams could i have imagined so much bliss the clouds which have so long hung heavily around the star of my destiny have been suddenly dispersed by one who views my heart aright who understands me who knows my sad history but recognizes my innocence who in a word rises superior to all the prejudices which shackle the world oh dearest dearest arthur how can i ever reward you adequately for this generosity on your part all the love which i bear you all the adoration i feel for you all the devotion i shall manifest towards you will not repay the immense debt that i owe you 
it is true that i possess great wealth that the services of my father to the state induced his majesty to create me a peeress in my own right and that i have some pretensions to beauty all this is true but it is not sufficient to induce my noble-hearted arthur to make me the partner of his bed no for he himself is rich far beyond his desires he also owns a proud and ancient name and england has daughters far lovelier than i but he loves me for myself apart from all selfish considerations and oh what bliss to be thus loved lady hatfield sank her head upon her fair hand and gave way to the new and ineffable bliss which had so suddenly enveloped her in its halo at length another idea struck her but my uncle how could he have known my secret she exclaimed aloud and how did he discover it oh he must have been aware of it from the very first the good the kind-hearted man never to have even appeared to georgiana's reverie was interrupted by a hasty knock at her door she rose unlocked it and gave admission to her friend julia my dear lady hatfield exclaimed miss mordaunt her entire countenance illuminated with joy congratulate me it is all settled that you are to become lady blunt asked georgiana smiling yes my dearest friend lady blunt how well it sounds only think of lady blunt upon a card printed for instance in the old english letter or german text or whatever it is and then lady blunt's carriage and all that sort of thing really i am so happy i don't know whether to dance or sing or both i am delighted to see you so happy my dear julia said lady hatfield and most sincerely do i congratulate you but have you acted prudently to accept sir christopher without communicating his proposal to your relations i think that i am quite old enough to manage my own affairs in this respect at least answered julia laughing and yet after all i am not so very old only just thirty still it is high time to settle one's self in life but for the present my dear lady hatfield i must implore you to keep my engagement a profound secret for reasons which i will explain in a few days i shall keep your secret julia without seeking to learn your motives until you may choose to communicate them replied georgiana and now i am about to surprise you in respect to myself lord ellingham has been here this morning so i heard from old mason just now said miss mordaunt but you knew he would call my dear friend after leaving his card last night and if you speak candidly you will confess that you hoped he would i did hope he would call julia answered georgiana but i could not imagine that our interview would have terminated however she added checking herself and smiling joyously you must now congratulate me for in a few weeks i shall become the countess of ellingham i do indeed congratulate you my dearest lady hatfield replied miss mordaunt but upon my word wonders will never cease here were you only a few days ago rejecting the earl in opposition to everything like common sense and certainly against the wishes of your very best friends let us not talk of the past julia interrupted georgiana the future opens so brightly before me that i am almost dazzled by its brilliancy and i am happy supremely happy oh almost too happy as she uttered these words georgiana threw herself into the armchair which she had quitted for the purpose of giving admission to miss mordaunt and never did the beauty of her soul-speaking countenance shine to greater advantage than at that moment 
and no wonder that even her friend whose volatile disposition seldom permitted her mind to settle its attention on subjects concerning another was struck by the loveliness of lady hatfield on this occasion no wonder we say that julia gazed with admiration for a long time on that beauteous woman for happiness seemed to have invested her with new charms her cheeks lately so pale with mental anxiety and partial indisposition were now tinged with a warm carnation hue joy flashed from her large liquid eyes usually of so mild though lustrous a languor and smiles played upon those rosy lips which were wont to remain apart with serious expression the earl of ellingham upon taking leave of georgiana that morning but be it well understood with the promise of returning to pass an hour or two in the evening experienced that kind of heartfelt happiness which requires a vent by means of imparting the fact of its existence to a friend to the abode of dr lascelles was the earl accordingly hastening when he was suddenly accosted by a gentleman who addressed him by name and whom in another moment he remembered to be mr gordon the diamond merchant i beg your lordship's pardon for thus stopping you said that individual but i thought you might be gratified to learn that the jewels which i lost so mysteriously have been restored to me indeed exclaimed arthur i am rejoiced to hear these tidings and now i presume you are fully convinced that miss esther de medina was entirely innocent of the theft so ridiculously imputed to her on the contrary my lord answered the diamond merchant i am more than ever certain that miss demina was the person who took them mr gordon exclaimed the earl indignantly i should have thought that after the investigation which took place at the office in bow street you would not have clung to an opinion so dishonourable so unjust towards an innocent young lady moreover sir i should have conceived that my testimony to that young lady's character would have dispelled any doubts which had still hung on your mind that your lordship gave such testimony conscientiously i cannot for an instant question was the firm but respectful answer at the same time that your lordship was and is still deceived in that young lady i am confident perhaps sir observed the earl coldly you will have no objection to communicate the reasons which have thus induced you to change your opinion for if i remember rightly you yourself declared in the public office that you were satisfied there was some grievous mistake and that miss de medina was innocent of the deed imputed to her at first i admit my lord replied the diamond merchant that i was staggered by the singularity of the turn given to the proceedings when your lordship appeared to speak in miss de medina's defence but listen my lord to the subsequent events which revived all my suspicions upon leaving the police court i returned home but was scarcely able to attend to my business so bewildered was i by the occurrences of the morning and so annoyed was i also at the loss which i had so mysteriously experienced it was probably four o'clock in the afternoon when a lady was announced and the moment she raised her veil i recognized miss de medina you may conceive my lord how surprised i was by this visit but much greater was my astonishment when she said to me without a single word of preface sir what is the value of the diamonds which you have lost six hundred pounds was my answer miss de medina immediately drew forth a small packet from her dress and counted six bank-notes each of a hundred pounds and which she placed before me on the table here is the amount sir she said and i offered her a receipt which she however declined for a few moments she lingered as if anxious to say something more then suddenly turning away she abruptly quitted the house 
extraordinary cried the earl of ellingham and yet one instant my lord interrupted mr gordon the most mysterious part of the whole transaction is yet to be revealed to you not ten minutes had elapsed from the moment of miss de medina's departure when a person whom i remembered to have seen in the court was announced i do not know whether your lordship observed at the office a man of florid complexion light curly hair red whiskers and dressed in a sporting suit i not only observed him replied the earl but from the description subsequently given by one of my servants whom i questioned after my return home from the police office i have every reason to believe that the individual whom you describe was the bearer of a letter which had induced me to hasten to bow street to give my testimony in proof of miss de medina's innocence and does your lordship know that man inquired the diamond merchant i never saw him to my knowledge until that day when the attention he appeared to devote to the proceedings attracted my notice although he was in the midst of the crowd congregated near the door but please to continue your own narrative this individual my lord of whom we have been speaking returned mr gordon was the person introduced to my office a few minutes after the departure of miss de medina he seated himself in a free and easy off-hand manner and said i think i can give you some little information concerning the diamonds which you have lost indeed i exclaimed and anxious to hear what he was about to state i said nothing relative to the visit of miss de medina and the payment of the amount at which the lost jewels were valued yes he continued and with the utmost coolness he produced a pistol from one pocket and a small parcel wrapped up in brown paper from the other what is the meaning of this strange conduct i demanded glancing towards the weapon which the man held in his hand oh it is soon explained he said this pistol is merely to defend myself in case you should take it into your head to give me into the charge of a constable on suspicion of being connected with the person who stole your property and as for the parcel open it and see what it contains thus speaking he tossed the packet across the table to me crossed his legs and began to hum a tune i opened the parcel and to my surprise perceived the diamonds which i had lost is the set complete asked the man quite perfect i replied in the most unfeigned astonishment at the singularity of the whole proceedings but how does it happen i continued that you have come to restore them to me when a quarter of an hour has scarcely elapsed since miss de medina herself called and paid me six hundred pounds at which they are valued it now appeared to be the man's turn to be surprised but in another moment he exclaimed oh i understand it all what do you understand said i for i must candidly confess that i understand nothing of the whole transaction which is one involved in the deepest mystery so let it remain he cried abruptly and now mark me he added in a slower and more impressive tone beware how you ever utter a word derogatory to the honour of esther de medina and he quitted the apartment leaving me in possession of my jewels and of the six hundred pounds also this narrative is so singular mr gordon said the earl of ellingham that were you not a respectable merchant and that you can have no possible interest in amusing me with a fiction i should not believe the portion which relates to miss de medina i declare before my maker ejaculated the diamond merchant solemnly that i have not exaggerated one tittle of my history i have even more to state the restoration of my property convinced me that i had no right to retain the money which miss de medina had paid me as a recompense for its loss i therefore determined to give it back to her but i was unacquainted with her residence then i recollected that your lordship had stated that mr de medina had become your tenant for a house and a small estate about seven miles from london 
i immediately repaired to your lordship's residence in pall mell to inquire the address of mr de medina but you were not at home your valet however furnished me with the information i required and on the following morning i proceeded to finchley i called at the house to which i had been directed and learnt that mr de medina and his daughter did not intend to settle there until the spring but from the servant in charge of the premises i ascertained where mr de medina resided in town i accordingly returned to london and forthwith repaired to great ormond street where i obtained an interview with miss de medina her father was out a circumstance which on the occasion appeared to give her pleasure because she asked the servant to announce me whether mr de medina were in his study and on receiving a reply to the effect that he had gone out a few minutes previous to my arrival she was evidently relieved of some anxiety i communicated the nature of my business but when i mentioned the particulars of the visit i had received from the light-haired gentleman her countenance suddenly assumed so singular an expression that i can scarcely define its meaning it was not alarm alone nor surprise nor shame nor sorrow which her looks denoted but a feeling composed of all those sentiments blended together then when i explained to her that this man had restored my lost diamonds her countenance suddenly assumed an expression of joy i handed her the six hundred pounds which she received and then as on the occasion of her visit to me the preceding evening she seemed anxious to make some remark to which she could not however give utterance the silence became awkward and i took my leave your lordship now knows all and can you for one moment imagine that esther de medina was the person who stole your diamonds exclaimed lord ellingham or that she was in any way connected with that man who restored them to you my belief is that she parted with them in some way to that man answered mr gordon and that her father most probably gave her the money to recompense me for my loss but that when she paid it she was unaware that the man had the intention of restoring the jewels lord ellingham made no answer for there suddenly flashed upon his mind a reminiscence which staggered him the reader will recollect that when mr de medina encountered his daughter at the police court he said to her o oh, esther esther i can understand it all you have brought this upon yourself these words were overheard at the time by lord ellingham but they had since escaped his memory or else failed to make any very deep impression upon him his own mind since that day having been a prey to much acute anxiety suspense and conflicting feelings on account of lady hatfield but now when he recalled those words and considered them in all their significance when he pondered upon the tale which he had just heard from the lips of the diamond merchant when he remembered that the man who had restored those jewels was doubtless the same who had conveyed to pall mell the letter which so mysteriously urged him to hasten to the police court and give his testimony in esther's defence he began to share mr gordon's belief that there must be some connection between that florid light-haired man and miss de medina at the same time lord ellingham was convinced that esther had not stolen the diamonds or that if she had mr gordon had mistaken the hour of the day if not the day itself on which such theft was committed because arthur remembered beyond all possibility of error that from two o'clock on the afternoon until near eleven o'clock at night on the day specified by the diamond merchant esther was engaged in visiting the house which her father had hired from him lord ellingham and which was situate about a mile beyond finchley arthur himself accompanied mr de medina and esther on that occasion and esther was never absent from his sight save perhaps for a few minutes at a time during the interval above named 
there was a profound mystery somewhere and though the earl was not characterized by any feeling of impertinent curiosity yet he longed to clear up the doubts and misgivings which had at length arisen in his mind he entertained the greatest respect for mr de medina and until now the same sentiment towards esther whom he had hitherto looked upon as a model of purity amiability and innocence he therefore felt grieved vexed disappointed annoyed for the honour of the human race and especially for the credit of the female sex to think it possible that he had been so grossly deceived in that beautiful jewess he walked slowly along the diamond merchant by his side well my lord said the latter at length breaking the protracted silence what is your opinion now i confess that i am bewildered was the reply but i shall not judge hastily in the meantime i pray you so far to suspend your opinion upon the subject as to avoid the utterance of aught prejudicial to miss de medina's character and if i succeed in fathoming this mystery the fact of that young lady's guilt or innocence shall be duly communicated to you the diamond merchant bowed respectfully and departed in another direction while lord ellingham continued his way towards grafton street End of section twenty Section twenty one of the Mysteries of London, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume three, by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter twenty one The Oath dr lascelles was at home and immediately granted an audience to the earl of ellingham popular physicians are potentates in their way and access to them save on matters of professional business is frequently difficult but the doctor had taken a greater fancy to the young nobleman than he was ever known to entertain for any of his acquaintances and he therefore received him as one who did not encroach on his very valuable time well said the physician as the earl made his appearance in the professional reception-room something new about lady hatfield i'll be bound you are right my dear doctor answered the lover and i am the happiest of men i am charmed to hear it said lascelles casting a glance of curiosity not unmingled with surprise towards the earl yes doctor cried the latter his handsome countenance irradiated with the lustre of complete felicity the beautiful georgiana has consented to become my wife your wife ejaculated the physician and wherefore not asked the earl astonished at the tone and manner of his friend do you think that i will allow what must be considered a misfortune to stand in the way of my happiness certainly if you can rise superior to a prejudice which influences the generality of the world said the physician thrown off his guard by lord ellingham's last observation i do not see ah then you also know all ejaculated the earl but let us not dwell on this topic suffice it that i have heard from sir ralph walsingham enough to convince me that his niece is to be commiserated in a certain respect and i have had a full explanation with her on the subject in a few weeks she will be lady ellingham and it shall be my duty as it will also prove my delight to make her so completely happy that she shall forget the incident which has had so powerful an effect upon her mind i sincerely wish you all possible felicity my dear earl said the doctor shaking the young nobleman warmly by the hand a thousand thanks doctor exclaimed arthur cordially returning the pressure but how 
became you acquainted with that incident in georgiana's life which has exercised such influence over her i thought you told me yesterday that she had not entered into any explanations with you neither had she nor has she my dear lord observed the physician who seemed slightly surprised if not puzzled by the observations of his young friend but as you yourself ere now said let us not dwell on that topic it is of too delicate a nature it is delicate my dear doctor responded the earl but as i am my own master and labour not under the necessity of consulting my relatives as to those proceedings which are connected with my interest or happiness oh certainly said the doctor you love lady hatfield and she loves you in return it is quite natural i have known many such cases more perhaps than you could imagine i do not doubt you replied the earl but i will not longer intrude on your valuable time he added smiling for i know that you are not in the habit of receiving visits of a merely friendly nature at this period of the day to you only am i accessible on such terms replied the physician the earl then took his leave and was about to return home when he bethought himself of the strange communication he had received from mr gordon the diamond merchant and as the weather was fine and frosty he determined to walk as far as the residence of mr de medina in great ormond street on his arrival at that gentleman's house he found the servant standing at the front door in the act of receiving some articles from a tradesman's boy and this trivial fact is only recorded inasmuch as it explains the reason how lord ellingham ascended to the drawing-room without being duly announced he considered himself to be on terms of sufficient intimacy with mr de medina to take such a liberty and when the domestic made a movement to conduct him upstairs arthur desired him in a condescending manner not to take the trouble as he knew the way accordingly the earl proceeded to the drawing-room where he did not however find mr de medina and his daughter although from the statement of the servant he had expected to meet them there the floor was spread with a thick rich turkey carpet on which his footsteps fell noiselessly he was about to seat himself when voices in the adjoining apartment which was only separated from the drawing-room by folding doors met his ears esther said mr de medina speaking in an earnest and solemn tone this is the third anniversary of that dreadful day which oh do not refer more than is necessary to that sad event dear father exclaimed the jewess in an imploring voice heaven knows my child responded her sigh that if you feel as i do i do i do dearest father cried esther yes but not all the degradation the infamy the shame all all father even as acutely as yourself she said in a voice denoting the most intense anguish and yet undutiful girl that you are exclaimed mr de medina you persist in seeing that lost abandoned the sudden rattling of a carriage in the street drowned the remainder of this sentence oh my dearest father forgive me cried esther in a tone of the most earnest appeal you cannot imagine the extent of my love my boundless love for that unfortunate unfortunate repeated mr de medina angrily no no say that most wretched guilty criminal my god use not such harsh terms almost shrieked the beautiful jewess and the earl of ellingham could judge by the sound that she fell upon her knees as she spoke yes esther on your knees implore my forgiveness for your 
oft-repeated disobedience exclaimed mr de medina consider undutiful ungrateful girl of the position the scandalous disgraceful position in which you were placed a few days ago that ring which was sold to the diamond merchant pardon me dearest father oh pardon me cried the young lady her voice becoming wildly hysterical again a vehicle rolled along the street and of the jew's reply all that the earl could distinguish were the words those diamonds esther the theft of those diamonds oh my god i shall yet go mad with the dreadful thought oh this is cruel most cruel after all i have suffered cried esther wherefore revive those terrible reproaches now say speak father what do you require of me wherefore this conversation again i must remind you answered mr de medina solemnly that this is the third anniversary of that day i know it i know it oh how can i ever forget it said esther in a tone of the most painful emotion and now continued mr de medina apparently but little moved by his daughter's grief now must you swear esther upon that book which contains the principles of our creed that you will never under any circumstances mr de medina here sank his voice to so low a tone that the earl could only catch a few disjointed phrases such as these renew your connection with acknowledge that such infamy and disgrace honoured name family seduced my daughter robbed her of her purity although the world may not suspect degradation on yourself discard you for ever thomas rainford i swear said esther in a tone which led the earl to imagine that she took the proscribed oath with a dreadful shudder and now rise exclaimed mr de medina it is over these words suddenly awoke the earl to a consciousness of his position and his face became scarlet as the thought flashed upon his mind that he had been playing the part of an eavesdropper he despised himself for having listened to the dialogue between mr de medina and his daughter but his attention had been so completely riveted to this strange mysterious and exciting conversation that he had unwittingly remained a hearer an invisible spell had nailed him as it were to the spot had forced him to linger and drink in that discourse which alas appeared to speak so eloquently to the discredit of her whose character he had so warmly defended two hours before and now suddenly awaking as we said to a sense of his position he perceived that a subterfuge could alone save him from the imputation of being an eavesdropper and to that subterfuge was this really noble-minded peer compelled to stoop hastily stepping to the drawing-room door he opened it and closed it again with unusual violence so that the sound might fall upon the ears of mr de medina and esther and induce them to believe that he had only just entered the room the stratagem succeeded for mr de medina immediately made his appearance from the inner apartment and welcomed the earl with his wonted calmness of manner in reply to arthur's polite inquiries relative to mr medina the father replied that his daughter was somewhat indisposed and hoped the earl would excuse her absence a quarter of an hour passed in conversation of no particular interest to the reader and lord ellingham then took his leave when he found himself once more in the open street he could scarcely believe that he was not the sport of some wild and delusive dream had he heard aright or had his ears beguiled him was it true that all those reproaches had been levelled by an angry father at the head of a daughter who did not attempt to deny her guilt but who was compelled to implore that outraged parent's forgiveness had he not prescribed to her an oath which seemed to imply in plain terms although the earl had caught but detached portions that esther had been seduced robbed of her purity and that the villain was one thomas rainford 
had not that oath been administered for the purpose of binding her to break off her connection with this thomas rainford and did not mr de medina assure her that though the world might not suspect it yet she had not the less brought degradation on herself in fine did not the angry father threaten to discard her for ever unless she swore to obey his injunctions in what other way could the blanks in the terms of the oath as ellingham had gathered them by means of the few but significant disjointed passages thereof in what other way could those blanks be filled up than in the manner above detailed it is too apparent thought the earl within himself and esther is an abandoned lost degraded girl and yet how deceptive is her appearance how delusive her demeanour purity seems to be expressed in every glance innocence characterizes every word she utters merciful heavens what must i think of the female sex after such a discovery as this and yet let me not judge harshly of the whole because one is frail my own georgiana is quite different from that artful hypocrite esther de medina georgiana conceals not a tainted soul beneath a chaste exterior she is purity in mind as well as in appearance and after all esther did steal the diamonds her father upbraided her with the theft he even alluded to the ring which she sold to mr gordon yes it is indeed too apparent she is utterly depraved but that name of thomas rainford surely i have heard it before the earl strove to recollect himself oh i remember now he thought at the expiration of a few moments it was thomas rainford who was accused of robbing my georgiana on the highway how strange is this coincidence and yet it was not that man who plundered her for she proved his innocence of at least this imputation but it was doubtless rainford who sent me the letter desiring me to appear in the defence of esther and it must also have been he who restored the diamonds to the merchant that esther stole those diamonds is clear for her father accused her of it at least such is the inference that must be drawn from his words but that gordon was wrong as to the day or the hour of the day on which the theft was committed is also clear inasmuch as esther was at finchley at the time stated still gordon was so positive and when he appeared to prosecute the jewess at the police office so short a time had elapsed only a few hours indeed since the act was perpetrated that it is difficult to believe how he could have mistaken the date there is a mystery yet attending on this affair but that its elucidation would establish esther's innocence cannot for a moment be believed such was the train of thought into which the earl of ellingham was naturally led by the dialogue he had overheard between the jew and his daughter he was sincerely grieved to be forced to come to the conviction that esther de medina was a lost and ruined girl instead of the pure and artless being he had previously believed her to be although his affections were undividedly georgiana's yet he had entertained a sentiment of friendship for the jewess and he was pained and shocked to think that he had ever experienced any interest even the slightest in a female so utterly unworthy his notice for the father he still felt respect which was also now blended with profound commiseration for he beheld in him an honest and honourable man who was cursed with a daughter characterised by bad passions and evil propensities the earl was well aware that mr de medina was a very rich man he could not therefore suppose that necessity had induced esther either to dispose of the ring or to steal the jewels what then could he conclude that she required funds to support a worthless abandoned and lost man her paramour hence the sale of the ring hence the theft of the diamonds 
arthur now remembered his promise to mr gordon to make him acquainted with any particulars which he might discover relative to that business but how could he fulfil his pledge he shrank from the contemplation of the circumstance which had made him acquainted with esther's guilt he felt annoyed and vexed with himself for having allowed his curiosity so far to dominate his honourable principles as to render him an eavesdropper he would not therefore aggravate his offence by imparting its results to another and with an endeavour to banish the subject from his memory and turn his attention to more pleasurable topics he hastily pursued his way homeward End of section twenty one section twenty two of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter twenty two the alarm the letter in the meantime esther de medina had retired to her own apartment immediately after the strange painful and exciting scene which had taken place with her father seating herself upon a sofa she burst into a violent flood of tears the delicate tinge of carnation which usually appeared beneath the clear transparent olive hue of her complexion was now chased away and she was pale very pale her grief was evidently intense anguish overwhelmed her spirit o oh, esther if thou art indeed a guilty frail fallen being the eye cannot refuse a tear of pity to thy lost condition no for never has even the enamoured poet in his dreams conceived a form and face more perfect than nature had bestowed upon her there appeared too such a virgin freshness about that charming creature who was just bursting into womanhood such a halo of innocence seemed to surround her so much modesty so much propriety characterized her slightest attitudes and her most unimportant words that to contemplate her for a few minutes and yet retain the stubborn conviction that she was a wanton amounted almost to an impossibility and now to behold her plunged in grief alone with her own wretched thoughts and weeping who could believe that the lips on which purity appeared to dwell had ever been pressed by those of the seducer that the sylph-like form whose sweeping undulating outlines were so gracefully set forth by the mournfulness of her attitude had ever unveiled its beauties on the bed of illicit love that the rude hand of licentiousness had ever disturbed the treasures of the bosom so carefully concealed who could believe all this nevertheless says the reader appearances are so completely against her the evidences of her guilt seem so damning that alas there is not a hope of her innocence but let us continue the thread of our narrative for half an hour did esther remain absorbed in the most profound affliction a prey to thoughts and reminiscences of a very painful nature at length she rose abruptly and evidently strove to conquer her grief she wiped away the tears from her fine black eyes and advanced towards the window from behind the curtains of which she gazed into the street with the view of directing her thoughts into some new channel suddenly an idea struck her and she hastened to her writing-desk at which she sat down and began to pen a letter while she was thus engaged the crystal drops ever and anon started from her eyes and trembled on the jetty fringes the glossy darkness of which no oriental dye could have enhanced 
in the midst of her occupation the progress of which was marked by many an ill-subdued sob a female servant entered the room to acquaint miss de medina that her father had just received a letter on some business that required his immediate attention and that she was not to expect him home to dinner the domestic then withdrew and esther finished her letter which she folded and concealed in her bosom it was now five o'clock and she descended to the dining-room but she had no appetite and the ceremony of the repast to which she was compelled to sit down alone was by no means calculated to enliven her spirits quitting the table as soon as possible she returned to her chamber put on her bonnet and shawl and hurried into the fresh air which she hoped would have an exhilarating influence upon her esther drew her veil closely over her face and proceeded to southampton row where she entered a shop at which the local post-office was stationed the woman who stood behind the counter appeared to recognize her and immediately handed her a letter which was addressed simply to a b c post office southampton row to be left till called for miss de medina purchased a few articles of fancy stationery evidently with the view to recompense the shopkeeper for the trouble of receiving her letters and not because she required the things and while the woman was occupied in making up the parcel esther proceeded to read the communication just placed in her hands for this purpose she raised her veil and approached the light which burnt near the window the letter was short but its contents drew tears from the eyes of the beautiful jewess scarcely had she terminated the perusal when she was startled by hearing a voice at the door distinctly exclaim there she is by heaven instinctively glancing in that direction she beheld a very pale-faced lad of apparently fifteen or sixteen gazing intently upon her from the immediate vicinity of the threshold of the shop and close behind him with his eyes also fixed upon her stood a very tall thin old man of most repulsive aspect the instant esther looked towards them the old man laid his hand on the lad's shoulder and hurried him away and esther somewhat alarmed by the incident took up the little parcel of stationery wished the woman a courteous good evening and quitted the shop when she again found herself in the street she drew down her veil and hastened towards the nearest hackney coach stand a vehicle speedily drew alongside of the curbstone for her accommodation and as she was stepping into it she distinctly beheld through the folds of her veil the tall old man and the pale lad entering another vehicle at a little distance she could not be mistaken for the shop sent forth a flood of light which rendered the forms of those two persons plainly visible the coachman had to repeat his inquiry whither he was to drive ere esther could recover her presence of mind sufficiently to reply to the nearest post-office in holborn she at length said why lord bless you ma'am there's one close by here not ten yards off answered the jarvey who was an honest fellow in his way never mind said esther i wish to be taken to another the man urged no farther objection but mounted his box and drove away quietly settling in his own mind that his fare was either mad or tipsy he neither knew nor cared which miss de medina could not shake off an oppressive suspicion which had forced itself upon her she fancied that she was watched and for the simple reason that she knew nothing of the old man and the lad her uneasiness increased into actual alarm this feeling was enhanced too when her quick ears caught the rumbling sound of another vehicle behind and she began to blame herself for having ventured abroad at such an hour 
then she reasoned with herself that no harm could possibly happen to her in the midst of a densely populated city and while people were walking about in all directions but still in spite of this attempt at self-assurance the pale countenance of the lad and the sinister looks of the old man haunted her like spirits of evil but in a few minutes the hackney coach entered holborn and the blaze of light the bustle the throng of vehicles the crowd of foot passengers and the animated appearance of the whole scene dispelled nearly all her alarms the vehicle drew up nearly at the corner of fetter lane and esther alighted another hackney coach stopped simultaneously at a short distance and her eyes were immediately directed towards it here's the post-office ma'am said the driver of the vehicle which she had hired miss de medina started recollected herself and hastened to thrust into the letter-box the epistle which she had written ere she left home the address on that epistle was t r number five brandon street locks fields this superscription was caught by the sharp eyes of the pale-faced boy who had stolen quick as thought up to the shop window and now stood by esther's side as she dropped the letter into the box when esther turned hastily to regain the vehicle she beheld the lad retreating with strange speed from the spot what can this mean she thought within herself who is it that is thus watching my movements and seriously alarmed she hurried back to the coach giving orders to be driven direct to great ormond street away went the vehicle again and the noise of crowded holborn prevented the jewess from judging by sounds whether the other hackney coach was following for that she was watched she had no longer any doubt suddenly a suspicion struck her like an icy chill could her father have employed spies to dog her to mark her movements circumstances on the one hand suggested the probability of such an occurrence while on the other the character of her parent was of a nature repugnant to such a proceeding he was stern and severe but strictly honourable and esther knew that he was not a man likely to adopt underhand measures then wherefore was she watched and why had the lad crept close up to her as she put the letter into the box the coach had turned up gray's inn lane which thoroughfare was more quiet than holborn and esther could hear no sounds of a second vehicle our readers are probably aware that the generality of hackney coaches have or rather had for they are nearly extinct at the present day a little window behind covered with a sort of flap made of the same material as the lining esther turned round and raised the flap to assure herself that there was really no vehicle following the one in which she was but at the same instant a face disappeared as if it had suddenly sunk into the earth but not before the jewess had recognized the pale features and dark eyes of the lad a faint cry escaped her lips and she fell back on the seat a prey to vague but serious alarm in a few moments she recovered her self-possession and again endeavoured to dispel her fears by arguing that no harm could possibly befall her that if any outrage were intended her screams would speedily bring hundreds to her rescue and that after all no real cause for apprehension might exist she arrived without accident in great ormond street and when she alighted at her own door the lad who had terrified her was no longer to be seen her father had not yet returned and she was therefore again left to the companionship of her own thoughts but when she was seated by the cheerful fire in the drawing-room and with the bright lamp burning on the table she smiled at those alarms which had ere now oppressed her the entire adventure now wore quite another aspect in her imagination the old man and the boy were probably thieves 
who prowled about to pursue their avocation where they could she had most likely been mistaken in the idea that they had entered a hackney coach in southampton row simultaneously with herself but they had followed her vehicle on foot and when she stepped out to post her letter the lad had taken that opportunity of creeping close up to her to pick her pocket having failed by the suddenness with which she had turned round he had afterwards got up behind the coach to dog her to the end of her journey with the hope of still succeeding in his predatory design but when she had looked through the back window he had disappeared such was the explanation which she now arranged in her mind for her own satisfaction but then what could mean the words uttered at the door of the shop in southampton row there she is by heaven fancy again came to her aid to set this point at rest she had most probably been watched by the old man and the lad before she was aware of the fact and they had lost sight of her but when they passed the shop her presence there had elicited the ejaculation from the youth such was the manner in which esther tranquillized herself relative to the little occurrence that had so much alarmed her whether her conjectures were well founded or not the reader may judge by what we are about to relate no sooner had she posted her letter to holborn than jacob who had managed to get sight of its superscription darted back to the second hackney coach which had stopped near the top of fetter lane and leaping in said to old death who was inside the letter is addressed to t r number five brandon street locks fields and that is tom rain's place ejaculated bones well do you follow her get up behind the coach and meet me at bunce's presently away started jacob and when he was gone old death alighted from the vehicle which he had hired in southampton row to follow esther dismissed it and walked boldly into the shop where that young lady had posted her letter a lad was in attendance behind the counter my boy said old death in as pleasant a tone as he could assume i just this minute dropped a letter into the box and i remember that i have made a mistake in a particular circumstance mentioned in its contents you can't have it back again replied the boy it's against the rules well i know it is said old death coaxingly but it's of the greatest consequence to me to alter a particular part of it and if you'll oblige me here's half a crown for your trouble thus speaking he displayed the proffered coin now half a crown was a great temptation to a lad who only earned eighteen pence a week in addition to his food moreover the master of the shop was absent at the moment and not very likely to return in a hurry for the boy knew he was with a party of friends at a neighbouring public-house and thus old death's silver argument was effectual well i suppose i must said the youth but don't tell anybody about it though what's the address t r number five brandon street locks fields the boy unlocked the letter-box selected the particular epistle and handed it to old death who threw the half-crown on the counter and marched off with the letter he could not restrain his curiosity until he reached seven dials or any other place which he was in the habit of frequenting and accordingly turned into a public-house in the neighbourhood there he ordered some refreshment seated himself in a corner of the parlour and carefully opened the letter in such a way that it might be resealed without exciting a suspicion of having ever been tampered with he then read the contents which ran as follow i sit down in anguish of heart to pen a few lines to you to you whom i love so sincerely but whom i must never see more my father has just made me take a terrible oath to that effect and so determined was his manner so resolute was he so stern so severe alas that i should be compelled to say so 
that i dared not refuse to obey his command and yet you know that i am as devotedly attached to you as ever all i have suffered all i have undergone on your account must convince you of my unchanged unchangeable affection do not then think ill of me on account of the oath which my father wrested tore from me my god how my heart palpitates as i write these lines oh if you knew the state of my mind you would pity me i am wretched heaven send that you are more happy than i alas cannot you take compassion upon me upon me your own tender esther and quit the path which you are pursuing it is not too late to do so it is never too late all might yet be well my father would forget the past and we should be reunited think of this ponder well upon it and remember how much happiness will be wrecked for ever if you persist in a course which i tremble to reflect upon to be connected with a highwayman is dreadful pardon me forgive me for speaking thus plainly but you know how sincerely i love you and if i write that terrible word highwayman it is merely to fix your thoughts the more seriously on that point what must be the end of this course of life public infamy or perhaps a scaffold again i say forgive me for writing thus i scarcely know what i commit to paper there are moments when my brain reels as i contemplate the subject of my letter i can write no more perhaps i shall find a note from you at the post-office in southampton row i hope so and i also hope that i may discover in it some cause of satisfaction to myself adieu dearest adieu esther the contents of this letter sadly puzzled old death they were quite different from what he had expected to find them but without waiting to reflect upon their nature he obtained a piece of sealing-wax from the waiter and so cleverly closed the letter again that even a clerk in the general post-office could not have told it had been opened he then retraced his way to the shop in holborn where it was originally posted and threw it back into the box this being done he bent his way towards toby bunce's house in earl street seven dials End of section twenty two section twenty three of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds old death when bones reached the place whither he had bent his steps he learnt to his satisfaction that toby bunce had been sent out by his wife on some errand which would keep him at least an hour away he accordingly followed mrs bunce into the back room and explained to her all that had occurred having stated how he and jacob had followed esther in the hackney-coach from southampton row to holborn he said when jacob first pointed her out to me as she was reading a letter in a shop i felt sure he must be mistaken for i could not conceive why she should be up at that part of the town since from what jacob discovered last night i thought she was certainly living with tom rain in locks fields however i determined to follow her and when she got down at a shop in holborn i told jacob to jump out and get another look at her if possible but instead of going into the shop she merely stopped there to post a letter and jacob was quick enough to catch sight of the address well when he came back to me and told me what that address was i desired him to follow her directly for i thought that if she was writing to tom rain it was clear she didn't live with him and therefore it was as well to find out where she does live to be sure said mrs bunce approvingly 
then it struck me continued old death that if i could only get sight of the contents of that letter which she had posted to tom rain it might open some farther clue to the nature of their connection and i did get the letter oh you clever fellow interrupted betsy shaking her head with mock gravity but what did the letter say why it was a regular sermon answered old death it talked about how much she loved him all she had done and suffered on his account and a lot of gammon of that kind she told him how her father had made her take an oath not to see him any more and how unhappy she was then she begged of him to repent and leave a course of life that is sure to end at tuck up fair did she use them words demanded mrs bunce no you fool cried old death she writes quite like a lady and in a beautiful hand too but after having said all i have told you she let him know that she shuddered at the idea of being connected with the highwayman and she begged his pardon for calling him so a pleasant letter for tom to receive observed mrs bunce very and she drops a hint continued old death that if he will give up his business there is a chance of her father forgiving tom for what is past and of their being reunited that's the very word do you think they are married then asked the woman i should say not replied bones because she talks of being connected with the highwayman and that's not a word a wife uses to her husband besides the whole letter didn't look like one written by a wife but rather a mistress and then it ends by saying that she hopes to find a letter from him at the post-office in southampton row find a letter when asked mrs bunce why to-day this evening i suppose said old death she had evidently written her letter before she went to the post-office in southampton row where she did find one from him because she was reading a note when jacob first twigged her and it was singular enough that we were just talking of her at that very identical moment then the letter you read wasn't an answer to the one she received in southampton row said mrs bunce of course not stupid cried old death we followed her straight down to holborn and she never stopped or went in anywhere to write an answer the letter i read was already written written too in the afternoon most likely just before she came out to go to southampton row and another reason that made me anxious to get hold of her letter to tom rain was that she didn't post it at the office where she received his but took the trouble to go down to holborn to put it in to another box i wonder why she did that said mrs bunce oh most likely to avoid exciting any suspicion or curiosity at the office in southampton row then there's another thing that puzzles me she was with tom rain last night jacob saw them together and followed them home to locksfields and she is away from him to-day writes to him this afternoon and hopes to find a letter from him when she goes to southampton row this evening one would think by this that they have been in the habit of corresponding together and that the place in southampton row is where he directs his letters to her so it's pretty clear that they don't live together for good and all but what perplexes me most is the sermon that she wrote him it's plain she stole the diamonds from what jacob overheard tom say to her when he gave her the earrings last night and yet she doesn't reproach herself a bit in the letter to him she only tries to convert rainford and to read that letter one would think she was as innocent of a theft or such like thing as a child unborn oh i dare say she wrote the letter for some object or another which we can't see observed mrs bunce i scarcely think so returned bones there was so much seriousness about it 
but she's a precious deep one depend on it said betsy look how she got off about the diamonds and after all perhaps her father had been talking her over and so if she wrote to tom rain in a serious way the humour won't last very long well we shall see exclaimed old death i should like to secure her in my interests what did you do with the letter she wrote to tom rain asked mrs bunce put it back into the post was the reply fancy if esther and tom did get together again and on comparing notes he found that the letter from her had miscarried he might suspect a trick somewhere and fix foul play on me no no it was more prudent to let the note go since i had gathered its contents well perhaps it was said mrs bunce one thing is very clear ben what's that betsy why that since esther isn't any longer with mr rainford in the fields it will be much easier to get the little boy away i thought of that just now said old death then after a pause he added and i'll tell you what's to be done the boy most be got into our power to-morrow night to-morrow night repeated mrs bunce yes to-morrow night returned bones emphatically i'll trump up something to get tom out of the way and me toby and jacob will go over and kidnap the child if we don't do it quick the jewess will be getting spoony on tom again and going back to live with him in spite of her oath to her father and then we may not find such another chance for some time to come mrs bunce smiled in approval of this scheme and was about to offer a comment when a knock summoned her to the front door she shortly returned to the back room followed by jacob what news demanded old death i found out where the jewess lives was the lad's answer and he named the address in great ormond street good exclaimed bones that shows why she has her letters sent to southampton row it is close by and as she's known in the neighbourhood she posts her answers at another place but give jacob his supper and brew me some grog betsy while mrs bunce was busily employed in executing these orders another knock at the front door was heard jacob hastened to answer it and returned with a letter directed to mr toby bunce but which having a peculiar mark placed somewhere amidst the writing was instantly discovered by old death to be intended for himself he accordingly opened it and read as follows tim put on the tats yesterday and went out a dury nakin on the shallows gadding the hoof he buzzed a bloke and a shakester of a yak and a skin his joman mutton-faced sow with her mall sack queering a raclan stalled a cross cove who had his regulars tipped the office cop busy and tim twigged that a pig was marking so he spieled to the crib while his joman shoved her trunk too to-day tim sent the yak to church and christen but the churchman came to it through paul as tim shaler had slummed on him a sprat and an alderman last week so tim didn't fight kokum enough and was grabbed the skin had three finnips and a foont which i've got at the padding ken t's twenty-three where well, i'll cop them to you for edging the gaff a fly kitten gone off will leave this flim twenty five old death having read the singular composition to himself threw it into the fire he then sat pondering for a few moments upon the course which he should pursue under the circumstances just made known to him and while he thus engaged in meditation we will lay before our readers a translation of the slang document 
tim dressed himself in rags yesterday and went out disguised as a beggar half naked and without shoes or stockings he robbed a gentleman and a lady of a watch and a purse his mistress mutton-faced sal with her reticule and looking like a respectable female was on the lookout close at hand a confederate thief who went shares with tim suddenly gave the alarm so that tim might hand him over the plunder and tim saw that a person was watching him so he hurried off home while his woman got off safely also to-day tim sent the watch to have the works taken out and put in another case and to get the maker's name altered but the watchmaker informed against him through spite because tim's mistress had passed off on him the watchmaker a bad sixpence and half crown last week so tim wasn't wary enough and was taken into custody the purse had three five-pound notes and a sovereign in it which i have got at thompson's lodging-house number twenty-three where i will hand them over to you if you will try and get tim off a sharp boy thief will leave this letter the signature twenty-five indicated the number attached to the writer's name in old death's private list of those thieves who were accustomed to do business with him anything new inquired mrs bunce handing him a glass of hot gin and water nothing particular was the reply only tim the snammer got himself into a scrape but i shall go and see about it directly tim isn't on your list is he demanded mrs bunce no but jos pedler that's number twenty five has got tim's money and will hand it over to me so a loud knock at the door interrupted old death's observation jacob was sent to answer the summons and in a few moments tom rain walked jauntily into the room well my prince of fences he exclaimed addressing old death as he cast himself unceremoniously into a chair and stretched out his legs in a free and independent manner anything new in the wind yes a trifling job for to-morrow night tom answered bones but you'll be making your fortune at this rate he added with one of his hideous chuckles the sooner the better cried the highwayman and then you'd be able to retire from business marry and settle yourself comfortably said old death with apparent indifference of manner but in reality watching rainford's countenance attentively as he uttered the word mary oh as for settling exclaimed tom laughing i'm not the chap to bury myself in a cottage in wales or devonshire i don't like that sort of thing business and bustle suit me best but what do you say to marriage tom a good-looking fellow like you might do something in that line to great advantage observed old death that's my own affair returned the highwayman hastily by the by what have you done with the boy that was thrown on your hands t'other night asked old death i am taking care of him to be sure was the answer if i abandon him he must go to the workhouse but what is the little job you were talking about a worthy citizen and his wife will pass over shooter's hill to-morrow night at about eleven o'clock in a yellow post-chaise replied bones inventing the tale as he went on the cit will have enough in his pocket-book to make it worth while to ease him of it and the post-boy will stop when he's ordered to do so they were to have gone to-night but something has happened to put off their journey till to-morrow good said tom the business shall be done anything else to communicate to-night nothing was the answer won't you stay and take a drop of something warm mr rainford asked betsy bunce in her most winning way no thank ye returned tom i must be off good night and the highwayman took his departure when the front door was closed behind him old death said with a chuckle well he'll be out of the way to-morrow night and we shall get hold of the boy but i shall now just step up to castle street and see what's going on at twenty-three shall you come back here to-night asked mrs bunce 
i can't say it's now nine o'clock and if i do it will be by ten jacob my boy you needn't wait unless you like old death then left the house End of section 23